This video was made possible by my lovely supporters on Patreon. Last week, I saw a scientific paper that immediately put me on the defensive. It made the counterintuitive claim that the globe warming was causing winters to become colder. And specifically, it was claiming that climate change was causing winters in North America to become colder via a mechanism that I understood very well. Or so I thought. Backstory. You may recall that earlier this year, Texas was hit by a wave of extremely cold weather. Or that in 2019, Chicago was hit by similar conditions. In fact, it was so cold in Chicago, it was colder than the surface of Mars. Cold enough that people were advised to not talk outside in case it damaged their lungs. Or if you're here in the UK, you may remember the beast from the east of 2018, this huge snowstorm that covered the entire country. All of these events were caused by the stratospheric polar vortex, an enormous donut of air spinning over the North Pole tens of kilometers above the surface in one of the middle layers of the atmosphere called the stratosphere. Normally it rotates at about 200 kilometers per hour, but roughly once every other year, it basically shreds itself apart in an event called a sudden stratospheric warming, where in the space of a week, the middle atmosphere heats up by tens of degrees Celsius. In the two months or so after one of these events, weather at the surface is changed. And specifically it's changed because the jet stream, which is this ribbon of fast moving air, is moved further south and it meanders around a bit more. And what that means is air that is normally trapped over the Arctic is allowed to meander a bit further south and sit over the UK or over Chicago. The physical mechanism by which the vortex and the jet stream are coupled isn't exactly known, but what we know for sure is that when the vortex yeets itself apart, extremely cold weather events are much more likely in the vicinity of the jet stream. I did my PhD on this phenomenon and I've done a whole video on my thesis if you'd like a bit more detail about that. Whilst I was doing my research, one of the big debates was, and really still is, if these sudden stratospheric warming events are becoming more frequent with climate change. The argument goes that because the Arctic is warming much faster than the rest of the world due to a phenomenon called Arctic amplification, the temperature gradient between the pole and the equator is lessening. And because that gradient is what drives the polar vortex, the vortex is getting weaker. And a weaker vortex is more easily disrupted, which means more of these sudden stratospheric warming events. However, the debate isn't settled. We're limited by the fact that these events don't happen that frequently, and we don't have that long a time series to look at. They were only discovered in the 50s. So much of the debate is based on how different computer models represent the polar vortex, and that can vary pretty wildly. So when I saw this paper seemingly weighing in decisively on the these events are getting more frequent with climate change side, I thought, here we go again. But it turns out the paper isn't talking about the aftermath of these sudden stratospheric warming events. Researchers have been so focused on these incredibly violent events, and they are, they're the most violent thing in the whole atmosphere, that to date, they basically missed something that was right under their noses. Because as it turns out, the vortex doesn't need to completely tear itself apart in order to influence weather at the surface. In this paper, researchers used machine learning techniques to trawl through past atmospheric data and identified a set of atmospheric conditions that, when they're met, the polar vortex doesn't break apart, but instead is stretched, it's elongated over North America. And this vortex stretching has the ultimate effect of modifying the pressure gradient across the continental US from east to west. To use pressure terminology, it amplifies the climatological ridge and trough. And because of how fluid flows on a rotating sphere, that increase pressure gradient from east to west results in more Arctic air being transported from north to south to the continental United States. So in the aftermath of one of these vortex stretching events, you see widespread cold temperatures across the US. And the temperature difference is of a comparable magnitude to those seen after a sudden warming event, like we saw in Chicago, for example. Now, I've got to say, I'm a dynamicist, so I think this stuff is really cool anyway, but that's not all that this paper did. Using statistics analysis and a dynamical analysis using a simplified model of the Earth's atmosphere, the researchers identified that because of Arctic amplification, the Arctic getting warmer than elsewhere, and specifically because the Arctic was losing its sea ice, the precursor conditions for these vortex stretching events were being met more frequently. And so because of climate change, these vortex stretching events were becoming more frequent. And further, that the statistical link between climate change and vortex stretching was more robust than the link between climate change and sudden warming events. So we're left in this weird counterintuitive position of the world warming, and the Arctic warming in particular, leading to winters in North America and East Asia on average getting 
colder. And this is something that is borne out in the data. If you look at the time series of snowfall and snow coverage in the high latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere, so the regions surrounding the Arctic, while sea ice extent has been shrinking and the Arctic has been getting warmer, the winters in the Northern Hemisphere have been getting colder and the snowfall has increased over the same time period. And I find this fascinating for a couple of reasons. First, it shows the pitfalls of how specialist science has become. I mean, I did a PhD on pretty much this exact phenomenon on, on these sudden warming events and we were so focused on that that we missed the possibility that the vortex could just get distorted, distended and I guess it shows that you have to be creative and in this case it was creative in terms of the tools being used, machine learning, to overcome the limitations of your narrow specialism, of your niche, niche if you're American. Second, it shows that climate change is not just the globe warming. It's more complicated than that. Sometimes there are these counterintuitive effects like North American winters getting colder. It neatly demonstrates that climate change isn't warming, climate change is extra energy being added to weather systems unevenly all over the planet. And yes, that often results in warming, but sometimes the effects can be counterintuitive. And third, it demonstrates the paradigm shift that is going on in atmospheric science. We've gone from one paradigm of a relatively static climate to a rapidly changing climate. And that has necessitated re-evaluating everything we think we know about the atmosphere from a dynamics perspective. Climate change is very much the greatest threat that humanity faces right now, but it's also a phenomenal opportunity to better understand the physical system of our atmosphere. The physical system that mediates, grants us our weather, and literally, the air that we breathe. This paper, I think, is a great example of that. But yeah, if you live in North America, maybe look at investing in a winter wear company. Feels like it would probably be a good investment. Feels like I'm wearing nothing at all. This was quite a different video to the kind of thing I normally make, so let me know what you thought down in the comments. Would you want it to be shorter or longer or more detail or less detail? Basically, I saw an interesting paper, geeked out, and I just wanted to make a video about it. As I mentioned at the start, this video was only made possible and my bills this week were only paid via my lovely supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to become a supporter of this channel and support more videos like this one, then the link's on screen right now and in the description. If you would like to support me in a non-monetary way, then just watching this video and liking it and sharing it with people that you think might be interested is more than enough support. So if you're doing that, thank you very much. If you'd like some recommended viewing next, then you can check out some of my videos up here. That just leaves me to say thank you very much for watching. I hope you liked it. If you did, please do pop it a like, and I'll see you in the next one.